today. So happy you guys are here today. So it's been a couple weeks, I think, since I was on. Um, and I, it's next weekend, 4th of July. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was thinking, because I have a project I'm going to share with you guys, but um, probably won't do it 4th of July weekend. It probably will be the Sunday after 4th of July. So um, yeah, and have lots of giveaways, some nice I think nice giveaways for you guys today. So I'll share those with y'all throughout the lesson today. But let me turn my camera over and show you and share with you what we're gonna do today, which is my Dragonfly Peonies plaque that I did. Now this originated from a piece that I did for the Society of Decorative Painters. Um, and it was on a journal page. And I get this question, asked often. Um, and I know Barb's, she doesn't have a mic, so you're not going to be able to hear. I'm going to have to repeat her questions. But um, I did this as a journal page, but I get this question asked often. Why paint on paper? I love to sit down with my paints, my brushes, my journal, and sketch and play and just create. So I can kind of have a little bit more ease knowing that it's gonna be on my journal page. And if I wanna take it to another surface, I can do just that. Now, there's, there's a little bit of a difference, right? I mean, I use different colors on here, different colors on my plaque, and let me zoom in just a touch. You guys can see that a little bit better. But my journal is where I get to play and have fun. And I have a membership group. It's opening soon. You guys are going to see more about it, hear more about it um, in the coming weeks and month, month, <laughs> um, month, because it's the end of June. Can you guys believe that already? It's the end of June. But I take the things that I absolutely love that I created in my journal and transform them and transplant them, I should say, repaint them onto another surface. And I love this surface. So let me show you another example real quick. So this was the piece I did with the Society of Decorative Painters, taught that on their um, Painters Academy. So if you guys have not checked that out, I do not have the link, but I know Barb could probably put it in the comments, but it's the um, Decorative Painters Academy for the Society of Decorative Painters. They've got great classes coming up. Taught that with them a couple months ago. Painted it on a surface. So, the other page that I did with my uh, membership group, and we meet three, four times a month, live lessons on my Facebook page um, group with them, which is private. So I did this page with them, and oh my goodness, I was so blown away. It's one of those things that you just, you open the group page and you see all these gorgeous pages and know that oh, they loved that and they got it and they're playing and having fun. So I created this page and I took it to the same surface, which it's not on that side. Let me see which side I have it on. This piece Again, I just love this surface, and I got it from Patty Rawlinson. And in the description of this live, you'll see the, um, it's a nine inch round from creativeartslifestyle.com. So I went ahead and I redid it on this round. This lesson I'm teaching August 19th on Creative Innovations Facebook page. But again, taking it from my journal to another surface. So that's your answer right there. Why do I wanna paint in a journal? Why do I wanna paint on paper? Because I can have everything collectively in my art journal. And if I wanna take it bigger or to a different surface, same exact way to do it or change it up a little bit. Again, just absolutely love working in my journal. Now, I did say that next week, but it's 4th of July, so it's gonna be the, hmm, What's the Sunday after 4th of July? The 11th? July 11th? No, July 4th is on Monday. July 4th is on Monday. Maybe oh. The 10th. Okay, so it'll be the 10th. I believe. But I did this page with my group, and again, absolutely loved no. all the things that they shared. You were right, it's the 11th. The 11th? Okay, great. So, the 11th of July, I'm going to take this from my journal, paint it onto another surface. And this is going to be my lesson here on 
Um, not sure if it's going to be on my Sandy McTeer Designs page or if it's going to be on YouTube, but second Sunday in July, I'm going to share and show you how I painted the glass jar and my hydrangeas onto another surface. So let's come back to our piece today. We have any questions yet? Oh my goodness, Bev, I totally agree. Can I tell you when I saw this finished, I thought the same exact thing. What a great garden stone that would be. Same thing with this one. Because of course, I decoupaged the words on, but you definitely could paint those on or just put butterflies and dragonflies on a whole bunch of garden stones. How fun would that be? All right. What, when is that one on creative innovations? Um, so this one on creative innovations is going to be August 19th. Um, Debbie Cole has created an amazing group and community over on Creative Innovations in Painting. And I will post and let you guys know, as I know she will on the um, Facebook group, but I will be sharing and showing how to do this on the evening of August 19th. You know, very honored that she asked me to teach a mixed media piece, and so we'll be there on the 19th of August. All right, thank you, Barb. Hi, Linda. Hi, Kathy. Thank you so much. Kathy Barnett from Louisiana. <laughs> oh, hi, Margo from Idaho and Mary. So I'm just going to kind of go up. And Julie, again, from Louisiana. Oh, my goodness. So Barb actually came with me when I taught, um, remember? With the, yes, in Louisiana. We had such a great road trip and a fantastic time with Kathy and all the other amazing ladies there in Louisiana. And the food, oh my goodness, the food is so good. I miss traveling. Okay, let's move on to our piece today. So again, this is a, a nine inch round from creativeartslifestyle.com, Patty Rollinson, amazing. If you've seen her online lately, she also has a company called Studio R12 and her stencils are par none. I mean, amazing stencils. So, but I got the surface from her and I'm gonna move that to the side so that I can see it. All right. And I do wanna show you how I did the background. Um, the e-packet is available on my website. Um, right when you go to the first home page, you're gonna see the picture of that dragonfly and peonies. You can get the um, e-packet for this design right there. And it tells you the number and everything of what I used, all the paints, all the brushes, I give you substitutes because I'm using a combination of these paints. And Barb, I think on my desk over there, I have um, Hauser Light Green. Okay. I think you need to bring over for me. Um, but anyway, so I have the um, Americana, and then I also have um, the fluid acrylics. So let me just show you. Both are listed in the e-packet because if you don't have this, you definitely can use the Americana. And I'll show you both. However, with this design, I used both of them. And that's why I have Barb going over to get that other color because I don't know about y'all, but with the pandemic and the shortage of paints, I have learned to use colors that I'd never used before and actually have loved so many of the colors that I probably would have just, I don't know, not used. So my favorite green right now in the Americana line is Hauser Light Green. So I will share that with you in just a second. Thank you. <laughs> as soon as we get Barb by in this little booby trap I have going on here in my studio, for her to sit closer to me so she can see. Okay. So I'm gonna pull this a little bit closer. Let's do that right there. Because I wanna show you how I prepped the background. So if I'm working on wood, MDF, anything else, I always prep the background, the surface, the sides, the front, and the back with DecoArt's Multipurpose Sealer. And you can tell the last time I used it, I used some neon pink. <laughs> um, 
but the multi-purpose sealer is going to seal that kind of grain pressed MDF board so that you don't get that um, texture coming up from the MDF. Same thing with the wood. It just kind of keeps everything sealed lightly in place, not going to move. But I'm also going to then come, after it's completely dry, back with some gesso. Now, my favorite gesso is the media line gesso, again by DecoArt. I am out. Have zero zip nada. However, let me just tell you guys, with things coming back being a little bit more readily available, that you can also get the gesso in Traditions. You can also get it in the media line, again, which is my favorite. And a couple places I'll recommend, you get those, again, from CD Wood, which is Cupboard Distributing, Chris Hoy. Love her and her company. And then also my friend, Maureen Baker, and it's maureen-baker.com. She also carries the media and traditions lines, but this is my favorite gesso that, I mean, I do my journal pages with it, my surfaces with it. It's just a great base coat, even my canvases. Cause you know, the canvases that come at Michael's and other stores, those have like the minimum gesso. So let me show you how I applied this to the background. So I'm just using a palette knife and I'm using this one. I like the, um, I like the way that it kind of bends right here. I just saw this comment. Actually, come on, before you started my comment. <laughs> actually, Donna Pulse, yes, I actually something popped up on my screen just here, so I think it must have been before you were in the um, on the page. Um, anyway, so glad you're here. But I like that there's a little bit of a bend and that there's a flat edge. Now, this is a no-no. I'm going to show you right now because... Any buildup you have on the bottom of your palette knife, that's going to show up in your texture. So I usually take hand sanitizer, and it cleans up your palette knives really well. But again, I like that bend. So I'm going to take out the gesso, and I'm going to work it into my little palette here. And I don't want to cover the entire surface. I'm just going to let it skip around. Now, in the packet, it explains to you, you can either paint your surface white first, just with regular white paint, all right? Snow titanium white, or you can paint over the dry gesso, completely up to you. But what I don't wanna do with the gesso is I don't wanna cover up all the space. So see how I'm picking up just a little. Let me show you the bottom of that gesso, or that, that gesso knife that palette knife. I want it to stutter because when you get those little stutters, it makes amazing texture in your background. So much interest, such cool effects. And when I do my um, live in two weeks with that hydrangea um, bouquet in the jar, oh, the amount of effects that you get in that jar from the gesso is incredible. Okay. So, I know I mentioned in the beginning that we have some giveaways, and so the only thing you need to do to enter the giveaway is to comment here on my live if you share, and when you share, make sure that you're sharing to a place that you're allowed to. I don't want you to share to a group that doesn't allow it, um, and there are some, so make sure that you share to a group that you know um, is okay with that. <laughs> Um, don't want you guys to get in trouble on my behalf. Um, and then you'll be entered to win one of my giveaways today. And we will do those as we go. And I'll have Barb putting those into um, Random Generator. We will see what names pop up. And I was shocked yesterday when I watched Tracy Moreau that I actually won a prize out of her, out of her live, I said, oh my goodness, no, put that away. Give it to somebody else. And she was like, no, you won. You came up randomly. So, but look how cool that is. And notice how I didn't cover every bit of the surface. Because what happens is when you come and put color on that, you get a different look. Even though I'm going to base coat it white, I just love that effect. So I'm just going to take a baby wipe. 
and wipe up my silicone mat. I work on a extra large silicone mat that if I were smart, I would have put on an Amazon affiliate link last year, the beginning of the pandemic, because I'm sure that I have sold hundreds of them for Amazon. So, Sandy. Yes. I'm looking at C.D. Wood. Yes. And it shows that she has the matte medium. Ooh, okay. So if you didn't hear that, cdwood.com. I know she just got a huge shipment of DecoArt products. She has the matte medium in stock, according to Barb. So make sure you write down that um, website address and go over and check her out with all of her DecoArt products. All right, I'm going to move that to the side. Now, I went ahead and prepped another piece so that we weren't here for three hours, although I'd love to spend three hours with you guys. I um, shot, Sharon shot. <laughs> awesome. That's kind of what I thought, but you can kind of take it the other direction <laughs> with the vowel, and it might not sound like shot. So I was just a little worried about saying that on camera, <laughs> and I didn't want to offend you. So, okay. So notice how I didn't put the gesso everywhere. When this dries, gonna be amazing. And this is my piece now prepped for my class on the 19th on creative innovation. So I'm gonna move that to the side. Once it completely dries, you're gonna paint it with a coat of white paint. But this is what I'm talking about. Do you see how you can still see where the gesso didn't cover the background wood? MDF board, you get a different look there than you do where the gesso is. So it gives you a very stucco, um, I don't know, I just absolutely love that look and I especially love it on my art journal pages. So I let the gesso completely dry, painted it with white, let that completely dry, and then I transferred the pattern. Okay. What is our question? No, Sharon said you ought to hear the telemarketing people about her name. Oh, the telemarketing people with your name, Sharon, I can only imagine. Mine's McTeer, which I find easy because it's like, you know, a tear on a cake, McTeer. But we get McTiernan, McTyre, lots of different interpretations. So I can only imagine with your name. So, but let me also tell you guys that if there are any interruptions with the Wi-Fi, internet, this is recording, it will be available here. I will post it on my YouTube as well. So far, so good, but we are working with the Facebook, whew, which has been a little crazy the last couple of months. So again, gesso on the surface with the palette knife. If you missed that part, you have to go back and watch it, unfortunately. My gesso is completely dry. I painted a layer of white paint over it. Then I transferred my pattern. And I like to cut my pattern down to the size and shape of what it is that I'm working with. And I tape it in place. Now, let me tell you something. I wanted my dragonfly to be a little bit more center than my original. And let me show you what I mean by that. On my original, he's a little low and I really kind of wanted him more centered. So when I transferred this pattern, all I did was I put the flowers on, the leaves on, I lifted it up and I moved my dragonfly up just a little bit. So see that at the bottom? And I transferred my dragonfly on. You can move, uh, move it, maneuver it however you want to to get that dragonfly where you want it. You could even shrink that line drawing in the pattern packet and make him smaller if you wanted to. Okay, so once I've got, gotten my pattern on, my line drawing, I went over everything with my favorite pen, which is an Identa pen. And I do have these on my website. They're double-ended, so you have a, a thicker tip. And let me show you the difference. This is done with the thicker tip. And these flowers down here are done with the fine tip. So... When this is new, you can get a really nice thin line. When you push real hard and you've used it a while, you tend to get a little bit of a thicker line. 
So on the flowers, the leaves, the dragonfly, initially I used the fine tip end. Okay. Excuse now, me. yes. Mary would like to know, would like you to repeat what type of gesso you use. Oh, okay. What type of gesso I use. So this is the one I have right now. This is the DecoArt Traditions White Gesso. Let me see. Hmm. Yep, right here. This is a very empty jar. <laughs> this is my go-to gesso. Now, let me tell you guys, it is a little bit on the thicker side. I like that because it gives you amazing texture. I can take a palette knife and put it over a stencil and get great texture and design with it. If you like a thinner, more liquid gesso, this is not it. However, you can take a little water and water it down. So if I wanted to paint this whole entire surface just with a, a nice thin layer with no texture, just to give it another base coat, water with a little bit of this is gonna work perfectly for you. But my favorite thing about this is that I like the, the thickness of it and the texture that it gives me on my projects, okay? So until these are available, the media line gesso, you might be able to find it in the traditions line gesso, just as great. Okay, so hopefully that answered that question. All right, so now that my piece and my um, line drawing is on and I've gone over everything with the Identa pen, I wanted to show and share how I did the wings. And I went ahead and I did these two flowers <laughs> and leaves just to save time again so that we're not here for three hours. Um, but I'm going to share and show how I did the flower and leaves up here after we do our background. Okay. But first is the dragonfly. So with the dragonfly, I printed off a second copy of my line drawing. And you have a couple options here. I went ahead and cut out I had one that I cut out the top two wings, and then a second that I printed out and I cut out the bottom two wings, okay? Now, the reason that's important is I can line it up, and instead of having to draw lines, I can use what I used, which is my one of my favorite Stampenda stamps, and that is it's called Grunge Script. Again, these are available on my website. It is Kling, let's see, Kling Grunge Script, right there, CRS5109. But this crackle right here, I thought, oh my goodness gracious, usually I draw lines. And where's my, will you, are you able to reach the dragonfly piece? Did I share that already? I didn't show that in the beginning, did I? Dragonfly piece? My plate. Oh, no. Okay, so Barb's going to grab that for me. And, and while, while we have this um, break, <laughs> this pause. Brenda said, can, can you use any permanent pen? Okay, so to answer that, Brenda, if it is permanent and it will not move or run with paint or water, absolutely. But if it moves or runs when you put water or paint on it, you definitely don't want to use that. So um, I know Sharpie markers used to reactivate with water. I think they've come out with some that you can paint over and it doesn't move. But my favorite has always been the Identa pen. Um, but if you saw my live on DecoArt's um, Facebook page Friday, I did a dragonfly reverse glass painting. Thank you, Barb, for grabbing that. And so I just drew the lines on the back. They're not exact. They're not exactly the same on either side. And so I thought, okay, I could either do that or I could do the very uneven with this script stamp, which I was already using because I knew that I was going to use in the background this stamp here and my um, one of my favorites, this canceled postage stamp right down here. And funny enough, I didn't use any stencils on this design. So what I did is I went ahead and cut out with an X-Acto knife the wing. 
You can use painter's tape and mark it off. That was the second way that I was going to share with you guys. I could come in and take painter's tape, which I have here, and go around, you know, but then you have to kind of move it and twist it so that you, or post-it notes, those work great too. Or I could just take an X-Acto knife, cut out that wing, line it up, I'm going to take that um, kind of crackled stamp in the grunge set, and the ink I'm using is stays on ink. This won't move. It won't bleed. It stays in place. is amazing. So this is my go-to. If you have a hard time finding these, they have them at Michael's, Hobby Lobby, other places. You can also get them on Amazon and the ink refill. So you don't have to buy a new stamp. You can get the ink refill and refill them. So... With that, I'm going to take that ink, and on the bottom, let's just line that up. You could tape it in place if you want to, but I'm just going to do that right along the bottom of that stamp. Line it up, and just kind of press that in place. And I'm just gently pushing. It might look like I'm really pushing hard. Lift that up, and voila, right there. How quick and easy and fun is that? So that I know it goes within my wing. If any line is missing, all I have to do is come back with that IdentiPen, and I can finish that. Or improvise and just make it look like I'm finishing a line. Okay? So, but I just, I loved the uneven, not perfect, crackled look that looks like dragonfly wings. All right. So, let's move that. We'll close our stamp. And I know I get this question a lot on my stamps and how do I um, wash them. Typically, I will wash them with a little hand sanitizer but you also wanna make sure that you rinse them with some soap and water because the hand sanitizer is an alcohol. It will dry out your rubber over time. So if I use hand sanitizer to wipe it off, I will put that into my water basin, rinse it with soap and water, and it's good for the next use. Okay, so before we move on to our background, um, all of our stamping and everything we're gonna do later, but what I want you to be aware of is how you want your piece to be. And I say that because if I pointed out my original and how a couple things are a little wonky, um, you would totally understand what I'm talking about. So if you want your two flowers here to be your straight on, or if you want this flower to be your straight on, meaning this is the top. So if I'm gonna set it on an easel, this is gonna be the top. So when I go to put my stamps on, I don't want them to go this way. I want the lettering and wording to go the direction of my piece. Now, again, on my original, they are a little wonky. They kind of go up because I'm looking at the dragonfly when I'm putting it on and I don't need to. I need to look at whatever my top is and my bottom, okay? So for the background, you can use whatever blue aqua turquoise color that you have. I think I used, I could be wrong, but I think I used um, trop, uh, turquoise blue, okay? In the Americana line, you can also use, if you have the media line, you can use the cobalt teal hue, but I'm just gonna put some of that out on my palette. And then I'm just gonna take a little spritzer bottle. So a little bottle from the Dollar Tree, wherever, that you have a little bit of water and I'm just gonna give that a little light misting. And I'll get to the colors and stuff I used on the flowers and leaves later. But to show you the background, it doesn't have to be done first. If I do the background first, I then have to go in and paint all the petals white, the dragonfly white, you know, so it's just a time saver to do the background this way. So I'm gonna load my half inch angle 
And I think we have some brushes as a giveaway, don't yes. we, Barb? Okay, so let's go ahead and give those to our first winner. And that's going to be these. So this is, oh, I love this set. So we have a three quarter inch flat wash, a number 12, um, and they call these flat shaders. My favorite brush company, Dynasty Brush. So you have a 12 flat shader, probably the brush I use the most other than angle brushes is the number eight and then a liner brush. And whose name is that? Paula, Paula Ransdell. I already have your information, girlfriend, so I will make sure that I get those off to you tomorrow. Um, but congratulations, Paula Ransdell. You are the new owner of these fantastic, amazing Dynasty brushes. Okay, so I'm going to have Bar put that to the side with your name so I don't forget when she goes home. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to use, this is a half-inch angle brush. If you're not familiar with an angle brush, it has a toe and a heel. This is slightly damp. I also misted my piece with a little bit of water. So I'm going to load the toe with that turquoise blue and I'm just going to come in and if it gets on my leaves and flowers that's okay. I'm going to show you how to take that off but using an angle brush you're going to be able to get into these tighter spaces and control where you put that paint. Okay, so I I do this. I'll see if Barb has any questions from you guys. No. Nothing. Awesome. Okay, so now now what I'll do is I'll take a little bit of that on my brush, and I'm just going to slip slap with the flat of that brush and spread that paint around. Now, dragonfly wings are transparent, right? So we want to go right over those dragonfly wings with a little bit of that thin down paint. The toe has the paint on it that I loaded. See how it's a little bit heavier? So I'll come right up underneath those leaves, right over those dragonfly wings, and my dragonfly body is darker, as are my leaves. So if I get a little blue on there, quite all right. So again, just right around those petals, and if I do get it on my petals and I get too much, you can always paint them white, so not a big deal. But again, I'm just going to move that right around. Use your finger to wipe it off. That's another great thing about that gesso is if you don't want it there, you can wipe it off right away and pretty much it's gone. Okay, so. And I almost did the background, but I really felt like that was an important step to share and show you guys that your background doesn't always have to be done, especially if you want those elements to uh, not, be, not be blue and have to take that step to paint in your flowers and everything else white. So see, I don't want it that dark here. I don't mind it dark underneath the leaves or flowers, petals, whatever, because again, it looks like it's an automatic shadow but everywhere else and my dragonfly is just in the way. So we're gonna go right over him completely. Get a little bit of that on the toe. I can go right up underneath his wings just to get a little bit darker shading. And again, a little water on my brush to kind of spread that around. Just like that. You could use a little bit of medium if you wanted to use, you know, the Joe Sonia fast drying glaze medium or flow medium um, to kind of help you spread that out. I'm not using so much water that it breaks down the um, makeup of the paint. It's going to adhere right to that gesso very nicely and give me the look I'm going for. Since I painted these, I do want to make sure I get that off. Just bring it right down here. Okay. Oh, I'm, and I will show you on something else in just a second. I, um, after you transfer your pattern on, if you do this with the IdentaPen and go over it, 
Or if you're working on another pattern and you have transfer lines that you need to remove and they're just not coming off, I have to share this with you guys because I tried it the other day and it worked like a charm. These little, um, what are these? Mr. Clean Erase. Erase sponges. Oh my goodness gracious. Get it a little wet, rub it on the piece, and it takes that transfer line right off. So if you're erasing and it doesn't come off, those um, those dry erase sponges work beautifully to get those lines off. I have to share this comment. Okay. <clears throat> Linda Johnson says, uh, you sure do help to simplify the procedure. She's been doing too much the hard way. Aww. I guess this saying applies to paint too, smarter, not harder. Aww. Magic that... eraser sheets is the name of it. Oh. Thank you, Linda Johnson. I appreciate that. You know, when you're pretty much self-taught, and, and when I say that, please don't misunderstand that everything I know has come from me. I have learned by watching other artists, taking classes from other artists at conventions. Um, I did not submit to teach at Creative Painting next year, but I am certainly going to support them and to travel um, and take classes because I've always felt like if I ever feel like I get to the point where I know it all or I can do it all, I need to put my brushes up and do something else because we're always learning and you have to constantly, continually educate yourself. And I have some of the best friends in this painting industry that continually share and show me things that I'm like, oh my gosh. And not just them, but people in my membership group that will share and show their pages. I'm like, why didn't I think about that? <laughs> you know, sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, that's so much better than what I did on the lesson. Um, so we're always learning from each other. And any tip and trick I can share with you guys, especially ones I've learned the hard way, I am always happy to do that. Sue Black says Magic Eraser also takes off old paint from stencils you forgot to clean. Oh, yes, it does. And on my silicone mat here, I use them as well. So if I have an area where I use some medium um, or some paint that's being a little pesky coming off, I will use that sponge on that as well. But look how watercolory, um, uneven, not exact beautiful background that you get using that technique right there. Okay, a little water on your angle brush. Again, put it around your elements, slip slap it here and there. And then I'm going to hit that with my favorite heating tool. That is, oh, thank you, Donna. Yes, I plan to submit for the um, Society of Decorative Painters 50th anniversary celebration next year in Vegas. Okay, so this is the heated tool. It's a ranger. Um, it can emboss. It can dry. It's nice and quiet, which I love. Doesn't sound like a jet engine. So I'm just going to dry this background just a little. Yes, I saw your comment, Linda. Um, Johnson said, you can also use the magic eraser on your project if you make a mistake and if you paint ornaments. So if you paint ornaments like that are coated, you can do a once over and get some of that off. If you rub too hard, it goes down to the silver of the ornament because most of them start as silver. Hi, Carol. Hi, Karen Boylan. Don't you love that background? I just love the way it looks. So watercolorish, watercolory, not exact, not precise. And again, with acrylic paint that pretty much dries fast and dries faster. With these tools, I do have a couple of tricks for you guys. You want to move it around often. You also don't want to cover that up. If you cover that up, that's the vent. That's where the air is coming out of, and you don't want to do that, or you might see flames shooting through. Had a friend that did that with an embossing tool. Okay. And then I like to kind of give it the touch test. If I get any paint on my hands, that's from before, <laughs> um, then the background's wet somewhere. 
And I also don't want it to be too hot. If I come with a brush and paint right now, it's going to stick right to that area. So I'm going to move that turquoise blue. I think I had enough for all of us to paint that piece today. Now, Jean asked, um, I noticed you set your brush down below the area when you were doing the background, I guess, and then go up. Why do you do this? Hmm. Oh, below the area. So I, if, if I'm answering this correctly, Marjean, I know that my piece is going to go like this, and I'll have a little bit of an automatic shadow right here. So it's okay if the blue's a little bit darker here, and it thins out here. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. So a little bit darker there, a little bit darker there, a little bit darker there. But I'm not too fussed or worried about that. Like I did it on these wings, didn't do it on those or on the body. Because I'm going to come back and share and show you guys how to do some amazing drop shadows um, and floating of color to get those um, shadows in. So, all right, let's concentrate on this flower right here. We're going to do this before we do the dragonfly. I see a little water right there. And I'm going to zoom in just a touch. Let's get in so you guys can see up close. Okay. Um, so I'm using, um, let me find it, move that to the side. I'm using, I'm going to use the media line. So quinacridone magenta. However, you can use a couple of Americana colors that I think would be great. You could use purples for that matter, whatever color you want this to be. So this color, quinacridone magenta in the media line, I think is pretty close to berry cobbler. Okay, so see that? However, to darken it, to deepen it a little bit, a little bit of a lizard crimson would work and look really pretty. And DecoArt just came out with a new color. Let me see if I can find that. And I love, love, love the name. Joyful Pink. Okay. So if you don't have the new color, you can use, see how much brighter this one is, like Royal Fuchsia. But if you want to deepen it at all, either a Cranberry or a Lizard and Crimson will darken that just a little bit for you to give you that nice color at the base. And I'll show you here <laughs> since I just did that and you can't see the camera. Um, but I want it to be a little bit darker at the base of the petal and work its way up. So I'm going to use the media line. Okay. Well, let's do that one in about a couple minutes. Okay. And get on with the, she's ready to give out another prize. So again, the only way you need to, only thing you need to do for, to enter is to share um, this post and comments and let us know that you are here and let us know where you're viewing from, where you're coming from. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and use, um, a smaller angle brush, like a three eighths. Let's find my three eighths here. Um, my go-to black gold by dynasty. You can tell it's well used. <laughs> Love it. Again, you can use some fresh drying glaze, some flow medium, some blending gel, whatever helps you move this color but I want to have a little bit of moisture in my brush. And I'm going to do us both a favor and move this palette so that you can see how I'm loading this brush. Okay. So again, you have the toe and the heel. I'm going to pick up a little bit of that color on the toe of the brush and work it in. Now you can see on my palette where I have a little bit of that moisture, a little bit of that water. If it's too much, it's going to tell on you. It's not going to stick when you come here. Okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to take that toe and we're going to float this at the base of the petal. And then I'm going to take this Dynasty IPC. You can use a soft or a medium or large, depending on your project, or you can use a mop brush. <coughs> A mop brush will work fine. And I'm just going to soften that just a little. Okay. Now, that color seems very light in comparison to my other flowers. But I'm going to leave it for right now because if I go over it, it's going to lift the color. 
So I just picked up a little bit more of that paint on the toe of the brush, and I tend to move around. So, you know, instead of just going right onto the next, I just move around the petals, soften that out, lightly press, and I'm tapping primarily where that color leaves off with where I left it white so that you get that gradual color, that gradient that goes up. So again, at the base of the petal, softly tap. We just don't want any harsh line. Oops, see I got it on the tip there, which is not a problem because we're gonna put white on the tips of those petals later. But if you get too much, just wipe it with your finger. You can kind of get it off. And then again, I'm just gonna lightly walk that color up on these petals that are a little bit bigger. So notice how I'm not pulling the brush in one, one like swoop. I'm lightly tapping it so that I get that really nice, soft, loose float of color. And then where that color ends, where it meets the white, where it really doesn't have any color at all, I'll tap that brush. Oops, got that right on the tip there. You didn't miss the flower, did you? Somebody asked if you missed the flower. I did not miss the flower, but that's a great question. I did not. I missed it the background because I was doing a wider, bigger area. Working here with just the brush and working on the petals, I can monitor how much liquid I have um, in my paint. And this is a really cool, uh, cool tip that I learned from Lana Lamb. She either takes a, the mister bottle when she's floating color and she'll kind of spritz her palette so that you can come there and get a little bit of water. I oftentimes just take it right to my water basin and I pick up a little droplet of water that's on the edge. Um, to control how much water I have in my brush. But I don't want it too wet. I want to be able to control where this paint's going. Now, this petal goes right off the edge. So again, notice how I'm just loosely floating that color on. I'm going to tap it right where the color leaves off and meets that petal. Same there. And again, all this is detailed instructions and step-by-step -step pictures in the pattern packet that I have on my website. Okay, a little bit the base of this one. Just like that. And I did see Robin's comment about how she can't wait for more things to become available. I have to tell you guys, they're happening. I, the stores look like they're a little bit better stocked. There are some issues with raw materials. I know that that's not just with the paint industry, but other industries as well. I mean, like Starbucks does not have something that, <laughs> to fix one of my favorite drinks. Um, and it's just the way things are. And, I, but I do think that they are, um, they're going to get better, right? We can only hope. Okay, a little bit at the base. And again, I don't have a tight grip on my brush. I'm not like this, and I'm not floating the color because when you're that tense in your hand, when you're floating, it shows up here. So you want a really nice, loose touch on that brush. Roll that in your hands. If you need to remind yourself to loosen up on that grip. That's at the base of that one, because that pedal's upside down or backwards. Barb's giggling, so is there a comment, Barb? <laughs> yes, that's the easiest shading I've ever seen. Aww. Well, wait till you see me float some drop shadows, because I think that's even easier. Sorry. That's quite all right. Okay, and then again, you want to remind yourself, sometimes when you turn your piece, you might think, oh, how's that petal laying? So again, this one, the base of that petal, pick up a little more color. 
And if my paint starts to migrate too much, I completely rinse my brush and start over. Okay, and then on this flip, I do wanna put a little bit of that color right there. Tap, tap, tap. And I'll turn this over before we do the highlight. Okay, just to kind of show you. So, how pretty. Again, you can see those wider tips on those petals, but where we laid in that color, you almost automatically get a shadow shading between the separate petals, and we'll beef that up here in a couple places. But what I did from there, and I'll rinse that brush, I'm gonna switch to, I'm gonna switch to this smaller angle. And I don't know where my 3 8 um, faux squirrel angle ended up. It's somewhere in my sea of brushes. Um, but I do like the faux squirrel brushes because of the amount of um, liquid that you can put on them. And it, I don't know, this, the bristles on these work really, really well. But so I'm going to switch to my quarter inch angle. I'm going to pick up a little bit of water. And unless I'm dry brushing or stenciling, I add water to my brush. I've always been told that wherever there's no paint, there's moisture. So, um, and I think I recently saw Peggy Harris shared that on a um, group as well, that you want to, you know, wet your brushes. Okay, white paint. You can either use the titanium white. If you're using the media line, you can use the titanium white. <laughs> Whatever you want to use, but I'm going to go ahead and get that out. Okay, so on that brush, again, a little bit of moisture. This is a good way to know whether you have too much moisture in your brush. If you do that and water drips down your fingers, you've got too much water. If you can feel the moisture in your brush, you're pretty good. But what's gonna tell on you is right here on your palette. Okay, if it has too much water that's bleeding and that color is not collecting in that little runway right there, you know you have too much water. And to be honest with you, sometimes I don't know it till I come here. And again, touching that onto a paper towel, getting that color to go away, it will, um, the color, excuse me, the water to go away, then you can reload more paint. Okay, so what I want to do on here is I just want to come right along the top and float this white. Oop, and I missed a little um, flip on that petal right there. Because I have very little paint and moisture in my brush, it's just going to go right over the tip of that petal, soften that look. Oop, hello, I forgot two flips. What am I thinking? So I'm just gonna pick up a little bit of that pink and put that right on that flip. And I had one right over here. Just a little bit. Okay, now let's rinse that since I added some pink to that. Again, a little bit of moisture in my brush, white. Work that into the toe of the brush. Both sides, so notice how I'm working it in. And then I like to flip my brush. If you do it like you're double loading, a lot of times that tip, that toe, kind of has a mind of its own. It's gonna pick up too much paint. So be a little methodical when you're loading that brush. Flip it over, load it, flip it over, load it. Then you know it's working on both sides of the brush. And you're just gonna lay that right in along the tip. Now if I went too high with my pink, like I feel this one went a little high, I can just pick up a little bit more white and again, to soften that so that you don't end up with a line, you can soften that with the brush. And you get, I just love that. I have, to, I have to hold that up. Okay, so see how it just nicely blends right in? Just like that. Oops, right outside the line there. Just pushed it back in with my finger. And this part again, so if you had like jagged lines, whatever with your pink, 
Put that white on, soften it out so they blend nicely. And if it comes off the edge, I typically don't even worry about that. I just let it go right off the edge because of course if I highlighted it right here, it really wouldn't make sense because that highlighted part of that petal is way over here. So, and sometimes highlighted things along the edge, draw your eye there. Um, and it just, again, does not make sense with where that color is going, so. Okay, the only thing I see right here that's bothering me is that little V, that little dip on this petal. So I'll pick up a little more white, soften that out, and then take that brush, kind of mop it out. All right, Barb, you're awfully quiet. Any questions or? Well, I'm, I'm checking out CD Wood, <laughs> and it looks like she has some medium paint because if she didn't have it, it would say sold. Right. I did see that the other day. Yes. So I know that C.D. Wood and Maureen Baker carries the media line. Okay. So let's just come back here and see how that flower is coming together. Okay. Now, what I wanted to do was I wanted to brighten it just a touch. So I think on these, you can see that there's just a hint of yellow. And I love yellow and pink together, but not real bright yellow. So that little touch of yellow on those petals, I use the same color, let's see. If you're using the media line, green gold, which is what I used, or in the Americana, you can use a little bit of citron green, okay? Now, they are different, see? but transparent and will give you a nice yellow kind of tone to that petal. So I'm gonna pick just a little bit of this out. Put that right there. And I'm gonna come back with that small angle brush. <clears throat> okay, so just on the toe of that brush, pick up some water, very tiny amount, and work that in. And I can already see that that's probably going to be too much. And I want to just pop it in here and there. So let me hold that up so you can see the difference. See how there's a glow and a shine to that petal? I don't want to put it on all of them. It'll look too exact and staged. And that one has a little bit of a line I need to take care of. So again, a little here, a little there, but not everywhere. Okay. And then I'm gonna go ahead and hit that with the heat tool. If you get too much and you need to soften it, again, that IPC or a mop brush, whatever you prefer, if you're not familiar with the Dynasty IPC, that stands for Ink Pastel Chalk. So they're a mixed media brush, and it's got a nice soft, almost like a deer foot. Um, and they do have a deer foot in this line, but it's a nice soft bristle. So it's not gonna make texture, it's just going to soften that look. So I am gonna hit that with the heat tool and I'll have Barb pick another name. Yes, and fingers make the best <laughs> dabbers, as you can tell. Mine are constantly covered in paint. Okay. Okay, so I went through my stamps the other day as I was trying to reorganize some things in my studio. You know how when it gets so bad you can't do anything? That's where my studio had gotten. So I took a couple of days off social media <laughs> and um, got my stamps organized and I found that I have duplicates so I love this stamp let me come out just a little this is a stamp and a stamp fantastic company that supports me just absolutely adore them um, this stamp is no longer available okay um, so this stamp and then also a die cut 
So if you have a die cut machine, if you don't hold on to it till you get a die cut machine, um, but it will just make great little masks um, and markings so that you could come in and stamp or stencil um, and it will cut out paper. So the cutting dies for the stamps, the stamps, and then another company that I love, actually I went to high school with her sister-in-law, the lady that owns this company, Dare to Be Artsy. And this is actually how I met Tracy Weinzapfel for the first time, was with her stamps. She was having a giveaway, and I was lucky enough to win them, I think in like, oh my gosh, Barbara, like 2015? 2015. So great artist, um, great share of, of her creativity. And so again, these are Tracy Weinzapfel, totally Tracy stamps. So the winner of these is Linda Johnson. Linda Johnson. So, Linda Johnson, I think I already have your information too, but you can private message me and I will get those off to you tomorrow. Okay? And we do have a question. Okay, there's a question, Barb said. Go ahead. Um, Julie wants to know what is the difference between the regular paints and the media line. Okay, regular paints and the media line. Fantastic question. And I should just do a lesson on this and... <laughs> Um, and post it on YouTube and here so that you guys can see. So, fluid acrylics don't have the, they don't have the solids and binders in them that regular Americana or acrylics have. They're pretty transparent. You can layer with regular acrylics. The layering you do with fluid acrylics, you get a totally different look. And that's what I absolutely love about those uh, paints, okay? So, I'm going to show you on a little bit of paper here. I'll just brush it out. And I won't take too much time on this lesson for these. But what I do want to show you is that if I take this heavy, I get a nice coat. If I take my Americana, which is going to be, depending on what color it is, a little bit more opaque, okay? Now, what happens, and you'll see when I do the dragonfly, when I add these two transparent colors together, which I'm gonna do with green and phthalo blue, you get a fantastic, amazing color. So, the fluid acrylics don't have the solids and binders, a little more transparent, actually a lot more transparent than your Americanas or re regular acrylic paints, and um, fantastic for shading, layering, and to be honest with you, my go-to paint. If I have to paint something in my journal, somewhere else, they are my go-to. They have a little bit of a sheen, shine to them, not a gloss, not really a satin, I would say below a satin, um, and a really nice finish. And the biggest, most probably amazing attribute about these they're highly pigmented. So look at the colors. This is a great, fantastic color, but look at that cobalt teal hue. The, the pigment in that is so concentrated and so amazing that these are going to be brighter, more vibrant, and as you're seeing me do today, you can mix these with your regular Americana acrylics. You can put these right over regular acrylics. I take my regular green and mix it with a little bit of fluid acrylic paints gray. They're intermixable. They work beautifully together. And you can do washes and glazes with these that will give your product a oomph. Like it just, it takes it to the next level, especially in color. So, okay. So we've done our flower there. <laughs> it's just going to keep falling, isn't it? I know. But what I do want to make sure I see is what colors I use on my dragonfly because I changed it, um, as I tell Barb off camera. Okay, so let's go ahead and take care of our leaves and leave this. I'm going to go back to, so the base color of my leaves um, is the color I was telling you guys. That's like my new favorite Americana green color, which is Hauser Light Green. I'm not sure, and I should ask. Not sure if it's named after one of my favorite people on the planet, which is Priscilla Hauser, um, and most amazing artist and friend. But Hauser Light Green is kind of my go-to green other than Plantation Pine. It's just a great, bright, 
but also neutral color for me to base my leaves. So I went ahead and I based those twice. Now this is what I wanted to share with you guys. So if I get my number eight flat, where is that brush at? Do I even have one here? I do, right there. <laughs> so when you go to base coat, and as I was painting this out um, yesterday and base coating things in and prepping and getting ready for today, I thought I have to remember that to tell them. Okay, if you have a line drawing or if you're just winging it, okay? So, but it, it does help if you have kind of a line drawing to go by. And for me, line drawings are a guideline. If I go and make that leaf bigger, I'm in control of my brush, I can do that. But what I wanna share with you is a lot of times if we are using a line drawing and we come right to the edge to put that color on, what happens is we make that leaf bigger and bigger with each application of paint. So if you know you have a line drawing, like you can see right here, instead of starting on the edge, I'm gonna start just inside the edge and then I'll come out to the edge with that color. That's gonna do two things. That's gonna keep that big ridge of paint collecting on the edge of your line drawing and smooth it out. And then of course you can smooth it right in the middle, do the same thing on the other side. So again, instead of starting right at the edge of that line drawing, start just short, put it on, and then bring it to the edge. Hopefully that makes sense. I don't know about y'all, but a lot of my projects from years ago look like they are on miracle Grow from the line drawing because it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's a way to control the shape and size of your um, design, okay? So turn that back over. Question. Question. Anne uh, Benny wants to know, is there a curing time for the media fluids before varnishing? Um, you know, Anne, I just give them a really nice feel, you know, kind of touch them. If they're at all cool to the touch, I will let them dry in another hour or so. Um, but like with any acrylic, you don't want to varnish it too soon because if it's still wet underneath that top layer, it's going to crack, it can crack and craze. So because these are so thin, and transparent and they don't have the solids in them like the regular acrylic paints, I've not had that issue. Um, I typically, and I'm gonna show you, I did my original, I don't know, what, a week ago, and I'm gonna go ahead and varnish it at the end. So, you know, I would leave it a few hours at least to make sure it's completely dry, not cool to the touch, and varnish it. Okay, let's take care of these leaves. So, I'm gonna use, you can use the media line is sap green or my go-to dark green that I like is plantation pine. So I'm gonna go ahead and use the plantation pine. And then also my favorite, probably my favorite go-to paint across the board. Any line, regular Americana, fluid acrylics is this right here. This is an amazing color, an amazing paint that does shadows and shading and darkens the values of colors better than just about anything. So paint's gray. And I don't wanna tease you guys, but it is difficult to come by right now. So, um, but when it is available, I hope it's available like in a gallon jug because I use it for just about everything. All right, let me zoom in again because I know we zoomed out just a second ago. Okay, and we're gonna go ahead and do these leaves. Like I said, I already did the other ones just to save time. And we're already on, wow, an hour and 13 minutes. How can that be? <laughs> Priscilla did create those three, Marjean said. Oh, Marjean, thank you. Yes, I, again, just adore her and absolutely adore this color. And again, that's something out of this pandemic that has really helped me look at colors that I normally would not use. Um, and it's, it's one of my favorites right now. All right. Now, this is, again, what I want to tell you about. So looking at this, you know, I have this leaf, and it's overlapping this one. When I turn it over, of course, this one is below. You can see the line. So I want to make sure that my shading and everything is on the right side um, of my, my leaf. So, oops. 
this that's okay it's all right so this does have two color uh two coats i have a little bit of green right there which i can get off with the hand sanitizer um but i do want to come in and separate these leaves give them a little bit of shading and i'm going to come back to my three-eighths angle okay so again toe and heel pick up just a little bit of moisture work that in I'm going to pick up some um, plantation pine. Let me move this over so you guys can see my palette. Try and move that. All right. That's where another camera would be good so you guys can see how I'm loading my brush. Again, a little bit of plantation pine. That's Americana. My paint's gray, which they also have in the Americana line, but I love the transparency of the fluid acrylics. Same corner, I'm gonna pick up a little bit of that paint's gray, and I'm gonna work it into the toe of that brush. Okay, and I paint rather fast, <laughs> so I'll slow it down. But you wanna work that into the toe of the brush, flip it over, work it into the other side, because you can flip your brush as you're shading. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start up here, and again, very loosely with almost like a U-stroke, loose float of color, right along the bottom side of that leaf. Actually, that's the top of the leaf. This is the bottom side of the leaf because my piece is upside down. And float that color on, okay? So again, little moisture in my brush, plantation pine, little bit of Payne's Gray, work that in small little U stroke, just a little, and that toe has the color, so I can control where it's going, take it off the tip of your petals, and I will say in the instructions, it does um, have leaves first, so you can do the leaves first and then move on to the flowers, in case you do what I just did and get into that um, edge of that petal. Now, if you find that you're leaving a line, or that your little loose U-stroke is leaving too much of a pattern, just softly tap it with that mop brush or that IPC, okay? So we're gonna come right over here, do the same thing, little plantation pine, little bit of Payne's Gray. Oops, I can already tell, too much Payne's Gray. Don't want it black, I just want it dark. right up underneath that petal, right along that darker side of the leaf. And again, kind of tap and soften that out if you feel like you need it. And I, I can tell you right there, I already know that I need it because I have a line. <laughs> See how I just did that? Wipe it off if it's not going the way that you want it to. And some days, floating's better than other days. That one, I could already tell from the get-go, the way I had my brush loaded, I was going to end up with too harsh of a line. Wipe it off and leave it. Now, I'll come back to it in a second, but I don't want to come back to it now. And I probably should turn my piece over because I'm floating... Um, backwards according to how this piece lays. So let's just go ahead and see if we can get that on. And then I think I might turn it. I think I'm gonna have to. We'll bring it down. There we go. Because I don't wanna forget that this is the bottom of my leaf. And I wanna bring a little bit of that color down. Okay, now, this piece, like I said, started as a journal page and journal class, which I also have um, on my website. But because I was teaching it for the Society of Decorative Painters, I did more of your traditional floats and colors. A lot of times I typically just slap my leaves right on, right? <laughs> um, right. But I do love the way that these look. So again, a little green. A little plantation pine, a little bit of Payne's Gray on the toe of that brush, and again, float that color right along. I 
you know, what, what I guess what I'm trying to say is a little bit more traditional the way I, you know, originally taught it because a lot of times I'll just do my leaves dark and then bring in light and I paint them so many different ways, but hopefully you guys are seeing how quick and easy it is to float that color on and not get so hung up on, it has to be perfect. It has to be exact. It's loose. And you can definitely see the dimension in the leaves, the separation in the leaves. At least that's what I'm seeing. I hope you guys see it too. Hi, Betty. All right. So we've got our dark on. Now what I do want to do is give this a little bit of a hit with the heating tool. And like I mentioned, I do carry these on my website. I just got another shipment. They are going quickly especially after Tracy Moreau's live yesterday on YouTube. All right, so let's move that out of the way just a little. Now what I want to do is I want to get that center vein. So again, same colors, a little bit of plantation pine, a little bit of that Payne's gray. I have some moisture in my brush. And what I'm looking at is this is the bottom of the leaf and that's the top of the leaf, all right? so my darker value shading part of my leaf, my lighter, brighter part of my leaf. So I'm gonna float my little vein right down the center and the shading is going to, so if I had a line here, imagine there's like an imaginary line right in the center of that leaf, it's gonna go on the right side of that line. And again, if you need to soften it, you can come back and soften that with that brush. Works beautifully. I'm gonna take that right off the edge. Get a little bit more moisture in my brush because it's dragging. Turn this around so I can make sure I get it on the right side of that leaf. I'm gonna lay it down, float that color on towards the tip. Oops, let's get on camera there. And same thing here. Okay. So, have all those center lines on, those center veins. I'm going to hit it with my heat tool. Rinse out my brush. Okay, now for the, the highlight, the brighter side of your leaves, you have a couple options. You can use the green gold, okay, which is, which is what I used. And since I used it on my leaves, that's what I used on the petals to kind of give it that yellow tone. Um, you can use citron green. Or you can also use the Hauser light green with a little bit of white, which I think is what I used on my original, okay? Um, I have both of those out. I'm going to show you the green gold, a little bit of white. It's going to give you more of a yellow cast, yellow tone that you can see there on the far right of your screen. Um, that Hauser light is not going to be as in your face because it's not as highly pigmented. Okay. So again, just on the toe of the brush. Working those in. Now on the opposite side of your vein, going down the center of your leaf, you want to pull this line. And I find it very helpful. Let's get on the camera there, Sandy. If you pull it from the tip down, and I'm going to slightly turn it. Oh my goodness gracious, do you see what I just did? I put my finger right in that paint. Okay, easy peasy. Wiped it off with the baby wipe. I'm going to pull it right down. So it's the opposite side of that center vein, which might seem a little strange that it's on the bottom side of that leaf. But you're going to get that nice contrast of that center vein with the highlight. If it's too much, I simply do that to soften. Or you can use the mop brush. Robin said, are you wiping off the 
IPC brush every time no. you use it? No, and let me show you the tip. That's a really good question, Robin. Look, there's no paint on the tip of that brush. I'm pouncing it, but softly. I mean, I'm not like really pushing it in. The paint's not so wet that it's picking up on the tips of those bristles. And this brush is dry. I don't use it wet. Nice and soft. And you can get this, um, I'm not sure. I believe that Deb Antonick might have them on her website. However, you can get them right there if you guys want to jot down that website. Thebrushguys.com. And if you use promo code, all lowercase, Sandy MC, and I'll, that's an affiliate code, um, I get a tiny little kickback, but what it does for you guys is it gives you an additional discount on top of their already amazing uh, prices. So brushguys.com, and you can find those IPC brushes there along with all the other Dynasty brushes that I love. Okay. So, Jean has a question about the leaves. The leaves. <clears throat> What's the question? When you say always on the right, is that because it's a round and can be seen in all directions? Yes. Well, I, I get what she's saying. So, yes. Um, great question, Marjean. Yes, because th see how these are pretty much rounded. I know that my dark's going to be there. My light's going to be there. My highlight's going to be where that light is kind of hitting it. Now, I'm not getting so technical that my light source is coming from here and I have to put a little bright spot here and a little bright spot there. It's, it's not that technical. Um, however... If I have a little bright spot here, dark there, I know that that's gonna have to be a little bright, right? Because light and dark have to work against each other or with each other to make things show up. So I have that light and dark going on right here with that um, Hauser light green, a little bit of white, putting that on the whole wrong side of that leaf. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, squirrel, and then I get off. So let's move that back, get a little moisture in my brush. If it's not moving, you know you need a little bit of water in that brush. Okay, and I completely did that line on the wrong side. I see that now, so I'm just going to do it right here. Now, right there where it meets the leaf, I'm just going to kind of rub it with my finger because... You can come back and put some shading there. It'll just take away any heavy paint. And then again, right up underneath. Oop, no moisture in my brush. See how the paint did not even come off. And then on that one, I will take the IPC and soften that out just a bit. Okay. Now, let me bring that down just a little bit. So they're starting to take shape, right? You can see those, you know, the darker base, the vein with the highlight on the other side. I'm gonna rinse that brush out. I'm gonna pick up a little bit of the same color, come right in here, work that in. Now, what I'm gonna do with that quarter inch angle is kind of put my brighter side on. If I start at the tip and I bring it to here, what's going to happen is, Sam, explain why you have the dark on top and the light on the dark. I thought it was the other way around. Um, you know what, Linda, that will be another leaf lesson. <laughs> you can do it both ways, okay? So I have seen it where there's actually light on both sides of the line, okay? So on my highlighted side, what I want to do is I'm going to angle my brush. And what I was saying before I saw that was if I start here and I work there, I'm going to end up with a line right here. Whereas if I start here and I work my way up towards the tip, I can control where those two meet. See how that just brightened that edge of that leaf? Okay, now I can come in and I can add a little bit of that brightness here if I want to. So I'm gonna do the same thing. Let's move this around. Right on this side, oop, gotta turn it around. Sorry, I'll give you guys some whiplash here. Okay, 
So again, starting here and working toward the tip. You know, and, and what Linda meant, that's such a great, it really is such a great question because um, one thing, and if you guys missed her question was about putting the light, you know, vein and the dark vein. Um, let's move that right there. Putting those, um, what are they, Barb? Those rules yeah. and it has to always be this way if you kind of think in those terms that it always has to be this way sometimes you miss out on those looks and natural um what's the word i'm looking for naturalness is that the word i'm looking for mm -hmm. i don't know um so i try not to get real hung up on you have to do it this way like Recently, someone said, I always heard you put all your highlights on first, and then you go back and put your shading. I always put my shading on before I do my highlights. I always have. When I've painted kind of in a traditional um, way versus my way, which sometimes just slapping the paint on um, or putting that paint on from the edge. So don't get hung up on the, it has to be this way, it has to be that way. Because I think sometimes when you do that, you really miss out on the pretty looks and naturalness of your piece. Does that answer that, hopefully? <laughs> okay, so let me turn that around because, oh, I love that yellow. That yellow tone in that leaf. Okay, now my leaf is going off the edge. I could come in and even though this is the bottom of my leaf, I can put in some of that highlight. And this is again what I'm talking about. Because it's the bottom of my leaf, I don't need to get hung up on, I can't put light there. I can put some light there if I want it first off, but, but it makes sense to put a little bit of light color right there because First off, it's coming over my dark leaf right here. Sorry, I've got to turn it again, just so I can get my hand right. Um, there we go. Soften that out, come back with a little bit of my dark. Where I started. Anyway, I don't know. This is probably the best example right here to show. So I'm doing the top of the leaves. This one, if I went by that same rule, I wouldn't do this bottom part, but I do think it needs to be on there, right? Because it's going to make it help. It's going to help it stand out from those two right there. All right. Are you grabbing my brush? <laughs> um. Kathy said, that's why I love your teaching style. You have always showed me to enjoy painting and not worry if I place a shade or highlight in the wrong area. You are awesome, my friend. Well, thank you, Kathy. And this is the thing I want you to not think of it as it's the wrong or right area. You definitely will know if a shadow or a highlight is in the wrong area. Um, I think sometimes, again, just like that case, where if my rule of thumb is you only are gonna put the highlight on the top of those leaves. I can't see the top of this leaf. However, what if a little bit of light is hitting it right on that edge, okay? Um, and so there again, that's just that looking to see where you feel like it needs to go. If it sticks out, it might not need to go there, okay? So there are our highlights on those leaves. Now, because I put this color on my dragonfly, I wanted to also put it on my um, my leaves. And I'm not seeing my color, which is, let me look behind me real quick, which is, I had it this morning here and I moved it, phthalo blue. Fantastic color. So you can also use in the Americana line, like a Prussian blue. Do they have a phthalo blue? Um, if not, I would use, 
I don't know why I'm questioning that. No, I don't think um, okay, but maybe um, like ultramarine blue, but phthalo blue and a little bit of yellow green light. Now, if you don't have this, you can also use sour apple, which is amazing. Okay. Thank you, Janice. Okay, so a little bit of that yellow green light. Now with both of these colors, let me see if you can, you can't see my palette. I'm gonna move it right here for you. Okay, so I'm gonna pick up a little bit of that color, a little bit of that color. And I'm gonna work it in right here. Okay, very little. If it's too green, add a little more phthalo blue. If it's too blue, add a little more green, okay? You can adjust it to your liking. But since I used that on the dragonfly, I wanted to put that coloring on my leaves. So I'm just going to kind of float that around, take that brush, soften that out. See how pretty that is? Oh, I love that combination. Again, phthalo blue. Um, it looks good with the, um, what is that, green gold as well. So a little green gold. I just like the brightness of that yellow green light. So again, I'm just gonna stick, it's just a bluey green. And I'm just gonna stick that there. I'll use my finger or that IPC brush. And I'm not, see, I'm not painting both sides of the leaf or the whole leaf. I'm just putting it kind of here and there. Again, you can use your finger, you can soften it out with your brush. Just like that. Okay, and I do love, I think you can really see it on these leaves. You could even put some of the pink. You could put some of the Conacodo magenta right on those leaves and it would look really pretty as well. All right. Now, the finishing touch for this flower up here um, is the center. And for that, I just use a stylus. You can use the end of your liner brush, whatever liner brush you use. And I'm going to pick up, let me find just my lighter green. Oh, I have it right there. Okay, so a little bit of the plantation pine and sap green and I'm just going to do a couple little dots of dark right here at the base of that petal for the center wipe it off I would let it dry but I'm going to go ahead and pick up a little bit of either that green gold and white or citron green and white and just randomly dot, and that randomly dot means you're not trying to hit every dark spot you put on. It's very random, so you get a nice little center. Okay, now I'm gonna stay right in here so that we can get on to that dragonfly. All right, some oh, some questions, Barb said. All right, go ahead. Uh, when you add a little float of color to the leaves, how do you determine how many leaves to add to? Um, good question. I added it on all of them. It might vary how much I add to all of them, but I think you can see that blue-green here, a little blue-green here. Didn't add so much on this one. Didn't add so much on that one. Again, random, and because it's thin and transparent, you can put that on, and then if you decide, oh, I wanna really bump that color up a notch, add it later. You don't have to do it all at one time. Does that answer? Hopefully, yes. yes. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's move on to our dragonfly. And then probably one of my favorite parts um, is those drop shadows, okay. So on our dragonfly wings, I have that phthalo blue. I'm going to get a little bit of doxine purple, okay? If you don't have it in the media line, you can use the regular acrylics. Get a little bit of that out. All right. I'm not mopping with a stencil brush, Betty. I'm mopping with the IPC 
Um, this is a medium soft flat top. Okay. They also have a deer foot. If I have that handy, I use that as well. Um, but there's a, so a small, medium, large. I don't think there's an extra large, but I like the medium. I just like, it fits in just about every spot. So, and it's got a nice soft bristle to it. You can see how nicely it moves. It's not stiff. So it's not gonna give me texture. It's gonna soften the look of what it is that I'm working on. All right, guys, so let's move on to our dragonfly. And I know I haven't done the stamping yet, but I wanna get this um, painted in and then we'll do our stamping in our background. I'm gonna use the 3 8 angle. And again, a little bit of moisture in my brush. I'm gonna pick up a little bit of phthalo blue on the toe. And move that over so you can see it. A little bit of, th and it's a strong, strong color. See how strong that color is? So I'm gonna walk it away just a little bit. And what I mean by walking it away is I'm gonna walk it away from that main dark color right here. Okay. And it's very similar to our background color. I'm gonna kind of lay that in. Come in, pick up a little bit more. I'm gonna wipe off the brush, pick up a little bit of moisture, a little bit of purple. Okay, and right along this bottom edge of my wing, oop, a little too strong, I'm gonna pull some of that purple. But what I don't wanna do is I don't wanna have a a top that's blue and a bottom that's purple. So once I get that purple on, I'm going to bring a little bit of that purple up, just like that, take my mop or IPC, kind of soften that so that you get a little bit of that mixture in between, okay? So a little bit of purple, again, have moisture in my brush, I'm gonna pick up that purple, lay it along that base very loosely. Because these are pretty transparent. Oops, right into that blue, go right into the purple. Get my hand out of the way. Bring some of that purple down, up just a little bit. Soften it. very tiny touch of color, especially if you're using the media line. And I know that the, the price on the media line sometimes is like, <gasps> you know, it's $5.48 for that paint, but you see how little I'm using. It takes the tiniest touch of that color to give you such a great, um, just blast of color because it is so highly pigmented. So I can see a definite line between these. I'm gonna pick up just a little bit of purple. And I wanna bring just a, kind of to break it up just a little bit. Or if you need more blue, you can pick up more blue. But right there, my wings are done. Okay. So I'm gonna come into the body of my um, dragonfly. Kind of the head, the body, and all the separate little parts. And I'm gonna use just a flat brush, this is a number four shader, just to pick up some of that color. Sap green or Payne's gray, you can use plantation pine and Payne's gray, just to get that nice, rich, dark color to begin with. And on my original, I think I started with this and then I did the wings. It really doesn't matter, however, I'm about to go over these wings because they're in the way. So if you wanna bring the wings back over, you certainly can. And then right down that body, again, just plantation pine, Payne's gray. If you don't have Payne's gray in either line, um, soft black will work good. Okay, but I do want it to be richer and darker than the green. So that paints gray is gonna just nicely darken that color, give me a nice base. Okay, so let me hit that with the heat tool. Check with Barb and see if we have any questions. No questions, good. Awesome.
All right. <clears throat> I think that's good. And I am seeing, if you see how the color's kind of separating right here, where I probably push too hard with my pressure. Just come back and paint that in with a second layer. Let's get that nice and dark. Because, of course, you have to have dark to see light, light to see dark. It's the one thing I do at the end of every single painting I do is to evaluate my lights and my darks. Sometimes it doesn't need to go lighter. Sometimes your shading and darks just need to be darker. So it's a good question to kind of ask yourself when you get done doing a project, put it, you know, off to the side, look at it from a distance and see what you feel needs to be adjusted. Could you tell them the code for the brush guys? Again? Absolutely. So that right there is the code for the brush guys. Um, I do have brushes on my website, but they'll probably give you the best price possible, brushguys.com, um, which is kind of funny because now it's a brush guy and his wife <laughs> um, since Jeff and Dave sold their company. Um, but you can use the promo code and it's all lowercase letters. Okay, and that gets you an additional 5% off. Okay. All right, so now that our body is done, and because I just hit that with the heat tool, my piece is hot. I don't want to go right to my piece with my paint. Guess what's going to happen? It's going to grab that paint right off my brush and keep it there. So I'm going to let that cool down for just a minute. Again, I'm going to go back to my number four shader, and I'm going to pick up a little bit of green gold or citron green and white. And this might seem like, wait, why are you putting that on? And then you're going to do this other color. There's a method to the madness. <laughs> because I feel like the next color I put on top, even though it covers this one, this one makes that other color shine. So even if you're using regular acrylics, I promise you. Okay, so I'm going to wipe off the majority of it. And I'm going to come right here and highlight by dry brushing. So, see how it's very stuttery and skippy? Technical term. Yes. And I'm just going to stutter and skip that color right along those areas. Okay? So, if you need more, again, load up your brush, wipe it off, dry brush a little bit more on. Hi, Isabel. Thank you so much, Robin. I love the wings, and I especially love the wings with that um, grunge stamp, right? I mean, it just, it's very stained glass looking. I think it's pretty. Okay, so I have that dry brush on. I'm going to rinse that brush out, dry it off well, really, really well. And let me show you my finished one real quick. Look at that bluey green color. Remember we made that and we put it on the leaves? One of the reasons I came back, so if you took my um, journal page class from um, Decorative Painters Academy, this is different. I mean, I added different colors. I wanted that bluey green on the leaves because it was on my dragonfly body. And when you carry those colors over, it just adds a harmony and a, a really pretty touch to your piece. So that's why I ended up putting it on the leaves in the end. So again, a little bit of phthalo blue. Come here to my palette. Phthalo blue, a little bit of that green. I'm going to mix it together. And again, if you have too much blue, work in a little bit of green. I'm going to add the tiniest touch of white. And that right there is going to be your telltale sign. If you do it and it's too blue, you're gonna go, oh, I need to add a little bit more green, okay? And I added just a tiny touch of white. I'm gonna come here to my paper towel, wipe almost all of it off. It's easier to dry brush more on than it is to take a whole bunch of paint off, okay? So I'm gonna dry brush that on. I think I wiped too much of it off. <laughs> there we go. Oh, I just love that color. 
on the dragonfly. I think it's so pretty. And then of course, right down its sections here, I'm gonna add a little bit more of that paint, tiny touch of white, and then highlight it even more, a little dry brushing. I think probably the biggest key with dry brushing is remember you can continue to add layers gradually. If you add too much at one time, um, it just it takes away from that really nice look of a dry brush. So gradually build those colors up, dry brush on additional layers. Oop, need a little touch of white because it's same color. So I'm gonna add just a little more white to the brush, swipe it across my paper towel, get a lot of that color off. There we go. And notice how I'm wiping it with my finger. It just kind of softens that look. Okay, love. And I can still see my lines coming onto my body from my wings. Not sure, because again, these are transparent. So if you can't and you want to draw those lines back on, again, you can do that with the fine tip of the identi pen. Okay, I'll pick up a little touch more white, just a little. Definitely right here, I want to bring a little bit brighter highlight. Just like that. Oh, love it. All right. Isn't that pretty, Linda? I love the way the body looks too. All right, let's talk about some drop shadows. Before we do that, let me also show you on my finished flowers down here and leaves, I came back at the very end when everything is dry and went over it, and I'm, I'm stalling to let my dragonfly completely dry. Um, but I went over it with the fine tip of the Identa pen. Okay, so up here on this flower that we did, when you come back over the leaves, you don't want to necessarily go around them. You can do it loosely. Okay, it does not have to follow the line. Give it a little bit of movement with the fine tip of that Identa pen. And again, it's not going to move, it's not going to bleed when you varnish over it. And again, main reason I use this pen. So if you wanna beef up any of these lines, it goes right over paint beautifully. It went right over the gesso nicely. Okay, so you can kind of just intensify those lines if you need it, if you want it. So let's move that out of the way. Okay, let's talk about drop shadows. And I'm gonna stay right up here and work my way down so that you can see all of them. I like to use a flat shader and this one's a number four, just like I used for the dragonfly. Um, you can use an angle brush, but the reason I like to use the flat shader is because I use a very inky paint and I float it on not traditionally. <laughs> I don't, I'm not doing like I normally would with an angle brush and go under something. I love, love, love these drop shadows with Payne's Gray. If you don't have paints gray, use soft black, okay? That when you put those on, look how that dragonfly just looks like it's gonna lift right up off the surface, all right? So, I'm gonna pick up some moisture in my brush and the tiniest touch of paints gray. Oops. Okay. The tiniest touch of Payne's Gray. Always a great idea to test that somewhere. So let me grab this paper. Always a great idea to test it. If it's too dark there, it's going to be too dark on your piece. Um, I was just looking at Linda's thing about the surface being gessoed. One of my favorite things about um, <laughs> using the gesso, Linda, um, and y'all, is 
it's so much easier for the paint to move. And even on a surface like this where we kind of gave it that stucco look, if I don't like it, I have some time to move it. It doesn't seem to like attach to the acrylic paint um, if my background's painted in like this white. Um, I have time to move it around. So that gesso is amazing. Okay, very inky consistency. Come up here. I always test it before I go. Now, what I'm going to do is, I know I want a little bit of a, and we'll have to see if this shows up, Barb. You'll have to let me know, because sometimes on my camera, it's a little light. So, a little bit of that loop, and all I'm doing is I'm mimicking what it is that I'm shading. So, I'm going to mimic that little loop, get it right next to that leaf, and right up underneath. Did that show up? Oh, I have to wait. <laughs> oh, oh yes, there's a delay. <laughs> So, a little bit underneath, and usually I'll put it on and I leave it, because if you go over it, it'll lift it. So, a little yes. bit underneath, it did? It okay, good. I am going to make it just a <laughs> touch. Show up more. Right, I'm going to add just a touch more paint, because I'm seeing it could add a little more, and just add a little underneath that one, okay? If I get it too dark, I simply touch it. It's easier to add more than to try and take a whole bunch off. So, a little bit of water in your brush, a little bit of Payne's Gray. Okay. Linda Sofranco says, do any of your, do you put any of your patterns on vellum? vellum before you transfer it to your piece. I'm not a big vellum fan. Um, have never been. Um, and because I don't work from patterns, other than when I make them for my pattern packets, um, this is my sketch tool right here, pretty much. Um, I did sketch some things out the other day and kind of surprised myself because I'm trying to switch it up a little. And I did those on some vellum. But typically, um, even when I print off my pattern, I print it off on regular white computer paper. I will use different pens to transfer my pattern, black, white, or not white, black, red, blue, um, especially like when I'm doing a convention or a seminar and I would do all those pieces, um, have just never, never been a fan of vellum. I do print some of mine off that window. Yeah, on vellum or on the paper bar? On vellum. Okay. So I, I think it's just a personal choice. I think the traditional way, of course, is on vellum. And then you just use the stylus. My thing with the stylus is I never know exactly where I went. And I know you can lift it up. Um, but I typically you know, print them off on computer paper and go from there. Okay. Again, soften that look if you need to. Very inky paint. And I love the way like that right there. Just that little... And this one is so wrong. <laughs> I just looked at that. I'm like, why is that going up? It needs to go down. Okay, but see that little loop? I'm just going to mimic the shape and way that that leaf is moving. And I especially love it. I'm going to keep a little tight right here on the dragonfly wings. So you can already see when I put the background color in there, see where I laid that blue in? You almost automatically get that. I do want to darken it a bit, though, with that Payne's Gray. So, let me you rinse my... Right up next to the... Not always. And I'm rinsing my brush out right now because I feel like I have a very dirty... Um, it's just not giving me what I want. Okay. So, right up underneath here. And what Barb's question was, do I always go right up underneath what it is that I'm doing a cast shadow? Not always. So... The wings, yes, you saw right there, I went right to them. However, coming over to the body, watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to go right next to the head and body. And then here, I'm going to go away from the body. Yeah. Now, what that's going to do for you, let's lay it down is it's going to make it look like that dragonfly is hovering over your piece. You just get a really nice shadow. And of course, I wouldn't have the same shadow here 
on this side. So just like with your lights and darks, knowing how far to take that shadow, where to place it. That probably could be bu bumped up a notch, but I'm gonna leave it because if I try and do it right now, it's going to lift. Um, that's the other thing, just like when you are using your regular acrylic paints and you go over it and over it and over it and it starts to lift. Um, same thing with the fluid acrylics, okay? So here, so watch here. With a chisel edge, and I have very little paint on my brush, and what I have on my brush is inky. So I'm going to come just shy of that and mimic the shape of the leaf. But then I'm going to come to the leaf. Okay, so what it does is it brings that out and gives you a little lift to that leaf instead of following it all the way along the edge. And I constantly will check and reload my brush so that I know that I don't have too dark of a color. Now, it doesn't always have to be Payne's Gray. You can use... Um, you can use your background color just at a darker value, kind of like I, you can see right here from my blue when I put the background on. Um, that's gonna give you that shadow as well. I just like the transparency and look of that Payne's Gray, so it has been my go-to for shading. Um, and it, it's, again, one of my favorite things when I teach, especially in person. <laughs> I know Barb can attest to this when, you know, at conventions and stuff or seminars and I show this and they're like, oh, I've always hated to float color. <laughs> and with the fluid acrylics, what's great about it, again, is because they're transparent. First off, they look a little bit more natural with that shadow. But you can get the same look with regular Americanas, regular acrylics. It's just very thin, very light application of color. So, do you not make a pattern first? Um, you know, Linda, I, I've i always painted freehand. Um, it's kind of how I started. And when I um, first started painting and copying, copying, I should say, um, I had a ceramic kiln and molds, and I would take people's china patterns and put them onto dishes, dishes that I had molds for. Um, and so they were unique. They weren't something that the um, china that they had, that line was, um, you know, had that dish. So that's kind of how I started doing it and have just always painted freehand. There's nothing wrong with a pattern. However, sometimes I think a pattern can be a little paralyzing. It's a guideline. It is, it is a guideline of where you're going to paint in. But if I decide that I don't like that petal the way it is, I can come in and change that petal. And I think that's my biggest takeaway is to just be, um, it does not have to be this way. I can change it and make it something different. <sighs> Hello, look at that right there. I got green right there. So watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take a little white paint right over it like it was never there. So, all right, Barb. So for our next and final giveaway, I have some amazing, I'm gonna show you one of them. Um, let me get a little bit more paint on my brush and I'll talk while I'm painting. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you one. I did not put on this piece, I did not put anything on the wings. On my journal page that I taught, I did put um, some Enchanted. And I'm going to show you some um, another thing, which is Holographic Illusions. Okay, let me, let me finish this. Yeah. I'm getting on to... Okay, so there's my little shadow for that. Okay, so let me zoom out just a touch, and that way you can see that whole, 
And hopefully you can see that shadow for that. And I think it probably could even be bumped up a notch. But remember I said, let it dry, come back to it. And then if you want to add a little darker shadow. Now, if you get that too dark and you're like, oh, what do I do? It's too dark. If you don't take it away right away, the best thing to do is take a wash of white or a wash of the background color and wash right over it. Okay, right over that shadow. That will take it down a notch. So you don't have to, you know, repaint the whole background or area that you think maybe needs to be repainted. All right. So the, um, the shadows are on. And my last giveaway, I'm going to share with you guys something I did not put on my original um, the holographic illusions. This is the DecoArt Holographic Glitter Paint. Now what makes this paint glitter paint a little bit differently is the glitter flakes in it are holographic. So depending on how the light hits it, you get a different look. And I don't know if that's really showing up on the label, but they kind of took the paint and made the background of the label similar. Is also, let me get, get this, which I didn't plan to, I had to reach behind me, but this is with the holographic illusions. Look how shimmery and shiny that is. And that's the, I think it's a turquoise color, um, but amazing paint, okay? So this one I have crystal ball. I also have for my third, this is all for my third giveaway, Prezi going to somebody. Um, Silver Extreme Sheen, which has an amazing patent pending um, way that they've taken the metallics to hit each other with the light and amazing, brightest, shiniest metallic um, that I use. And then a pearlizing medium. Now, you can mix this with any paint. You can mix it with the Americana, you can mix it with the Media Line, and it's gonna pearlize that paint for you, okay? Fantastic product. Um, and the winner of this goes to? Chris Evola. Chris Evola. Chris Evola. So, message me your information, and those three will go out to you tomorrow. Okay, I'm gonna hand those back to Barb. Let's do our stamping. So I'm gonna move my palette out of the way, come over to our stamps. Again, I'm using the Stays On ink pad. And my um, grunge stamp has this little cancellation postage stamp here. So I'm going to load that up. And I like to take my ink pad and go over my stamp. And if you're worried, do this on a piece of paper before you go to your piece. It always looks better too once you've inked your stamp and you ink it again. The ink sticks to ink better than it sticks to your brand new stamp. So when you get the brand new package, ink it up, put it on a piece of paper, come back, ink it again. That ink's gonna stick better for you. All right, so I know that I want my piece this way. I'm gonna put that stamp there and there and I like it to overlap things so I'm going to let it overlap that flower okay so I kind of have it kind of that triangle of design so I have it in three places you don't want to put it in four if you put it in four go ahead and stamp it somewhere in five okay just looks better in odd numbers so I'm going to take that off and I'm going to use this stamp but I don't want to use the whole thing I just want to use pieces and parts so, and I'm shocked that I did not use my vintage note stamp. Wow. Because that's, for years, that one's been my favorite. But this is what I was talking about in the beginning, that you do want your, like, I wouldn't want it to go this way. I do want, since my piece is going to be here, and that's how I'm going to display it, that my wording goes that way. Okay? So, again, you can lay it onto a block and these rubber ones, if it's not sticking, mist it with a little bit of water. And it will stick on an acrylic pad for you better. Okay, so I'm just kind of giving that. This is a brand new ink pad too, so I know that it's going to um, ink well. 
If you don't know, again, try it on a scrap piece of paper and then see how I put it over to the side? You never want to do it there because when it falls, it's going to ink where it is. So I want to make sure that that is attached to that block. Come over here and I'm just going to take it right off the edge, touch it. And then I'm going to come down here and just use a little bit of that. And then right there. Okay, again, that triangle of design. So I have little images, although I said not four, but it does need a little something there. And let's do, since I have it in four places, let's do a little something here. There we go. Do you have these on your website? I do have those, yep. So the grunge stamp is on my website underneath the uh, rubber stamps. Okay, so there's our stamping. Easy peasy, right? Now, the finished thing I want to do on here is the edge. I kind of want to frame this in and bring your eye into the design. And I'm going to do that with a baby wipe. And I said the last thing, but I'm going to frame it in. Then I'm going to show you because I can't end a project without splattering. Hello. And I have to cough. I'm so sorry. You don't have to hear me cough. Okay, so I took a baby wipe. I'm gonna wrap it around my index finger. All right, right around my index finger. Put all of it in the palm of your hand. Come here to your Payne's Gray. Pick up a little bit of Payne's Gray or soft black, and I'm just gonna work it back and forth, just like I would a brush, an angle brush, having it loaded just on the toe. This is on the tip of my finger. Now this is key. You want your wrist on the inside of your piece. If you have it out here, it's gonna leave a line, a very defined line. The moisture in your baby wipe is gonna help carry that color. And I'm gonna go right around the edge and I'm gonna move my piece. Get a little more paint. Moving my piece is going to remind me that my wrist has to stay in the middle of that surface. Right over my leaves, right over my flower, everything on the edge. Bring it right in. Now, let's get that right up there on the camera. Notice how that just draws your eye right into that dragonfly. Again, that triangle of design with our flowers that just pop off that piece, our stamped background. You could put a little bit more in here. You know, if you didn't want it so open, you definitely could put a little bit more stamping. But to me, the, um, the splatter kind of helps fill that area in. So I splattered with Payne's Gray, Thalo Blue, and White. And a lot of times my thinking behind what I splatter is my background color or a prominent color in my piece. I didn't want to pull out the prominent color of the pink, but I knew I wanted to pick out, if you will, the prominent color of that phthalo blue. So I'm gonna pick up my number eight flat, get it nice and wet. It's really, really wet. In fact, I wanna bring it right over here so I can show you. See how wet that is and very inky that paint is. Such a strong, strong color. So a little bit more water. And I'm gonna take the handle of this brush over the handle of another brush. And the head of this brush, wherever that is, that's where my splatter primarily is gonna go. However, splatter has a mind of its own, it's gonna go where it wants to. But I know if I put it here, I'm gonna be able to control where it goes. So I'll put a little there and I'll put a little here and a little there. I'm gonna rinse out my brush quickly because I can already tell you I don't want it on my flower. So my brush has a little bit of water and I'm just picking that right up off of my flower. I don't mind a little, but I don't want heavy splatter on my flower, all right? Now I'm gonna let that sit for just a minute. Well, not a minute, maybe a couple seconds. Bye, Linda Grass. Thanks for being here today. Okay, so little paper towel. I'm just gonna lightly press 
Don't you love this round circle piece, Brenda? I do. When I saw it on Patty Rawlinson's site, I thought, oh my gosh, I have to get that. And I loved it for the other piece I'm teaching at Creative Innovations too. That butterfly was perfect. Okay, so what I want you to see is when you press that paper towel onto the splatter, you can see your regular normal splatter where it's heavier, but then it lifted color on some of that splatter and it gives you more of a stained look. One of my favorite, favorite ways to splatter, and I learned that years ago from Kelly Hornig. She did that in a, a mixed media thing that I took and I absolutely, it has stuck with me. <laughs> um, so again, get that nice little splatter stain look. So that's with the phthalo blue. And then I'm gonna repeat that with a little bit of Payne's Gray or black, whichever you wanna use. I like the Payne's Gray because it's not as harsh as black. So get a little bit more. And then again, kind of the same general area. A little there, maybe a little higher, and a little right in here. And again, I know that I want some of this taken away from areas, especially if like there's just one dot, a lot of times I'll just lift that because it seems odd or off. If I have a lot of dots that hit a leaf, I'll leave it. But certainly nothing that's just kind of a here or there dot of color. Again, let that sit for just a second. And then very lightly, I'm not pushing it might look like I'm pushing, but I'm just touching so that it lifts that color. Okay, and then finally white. And I need clean white because I was a very, very bad painter today and I went right into the middle of all my white. And so it's very contaminated. So I'll pick up some of that white. And the white to me at the end kind of softens that other splatter. And I don't mind getting it here and there on the wings. And again, right there. What size is the surface? This is a nine inch round. And again, in the description on the live at the top, you should see um, Patty Rollinson, Creative Arts Lifestyle. Um, I'll be honest with you, I got them when they were on sale. I don't know how much they are right now, but I did get them when they were on sale. I thought they were a great price, and I ordered 10 of them um, because I saw so many things that I could paint on it. Okay, again, the white, I'm going to let it sit. And I don't always um, put the do, put the do. I don't always do the paper towel on all the splatter. If I want the splatter to stand out a little bit more, sometimes I leave the white without touching it with the paper towel or sometimes I leave the black without um, using the paper towel or paints gray. But again, I just like the way it softens it, the way it makes it look. Okay, just like that. So quick, easy, fun, right? And so colorful and vibrant. Um, I do wanna share one last thing. Again, once I'm done completely, I'll go back with my IdentiPen and re-identify anything I want to, loosely outline my leaves. I typically don't come back down the center vein. Um, and then some lines, like you see here. Those are, let's go back up there, Sandy. These are optional. If you wanna do those, again, let me find my IdentiPen. They're very loose. It's just a, sketchy little line at the base of these petals. Okay, just to give it a little bit of interest, um, like you can see vein lines in those petals. I did that for both of those, all right? And one thing I typically neglect sharing when I um, do these lives is my very last step, and that's varnishing. Um, and varnishing I think super important whether or not you're painting in your journal or painting on a surface, it just protects everything that you've done. If you don't have your favorite varnish, put a uh, very light coat of, you could even use the multi-purpose sealer, glazing medium, 
little touch of matte medium over it, but my favorite go-to varnish is the Soft Touch Varnish by DecoArt. They have it in this. They also have it in the uh, DuraClear line. Um, also, I believe the Chalky Finish line has the Soft Touch Varnish, my favorite. It just makes it feel so pretty, and I'm gonna shake that up. Mix, make sure it's all mixed together. And I will take, I love these um, Dynasty Eye of the Tiger brushes. Just a nice, soft bristle. Um, and that's pretty much everything, the only brush I use to varnish everything with. So I used to use a three-quarter, just a regular three-quarter, but I have found with this brush, it's soft enough that it doesn't make the grooves um, and movement in that varnish. And... Oh, just lays it on beautifully. So I will put that over the entire piece. I don't know if one of its attributes is self-leveling, but I have found that it pretty much just softens. I don't see any ridges or anything. A lot of that has to do with the brush as well as the amount of varnish that I've put on. I didn't cake it on. It's just a nice one coat of varnish right over that piece, okay? And then typically... I will do the sides as well, just to make sure that everything is good to go. But that just protects your piece. I'm not, I don't like gloss, which is kind of funny because I'm like into glitter and everything blingy. But when it comes to my art pieces, I do like for there to be um, just that nice matte, soft to the touch finish on your piece. So again, personal preference, they make this in gloss, satin, um, high gloss, I think. So you can kind of pick and choose what you want on your piece. I think we've done all of our giveaways, right? Yes. Thank you again so much for being here. Would love for you to share this with your friends, like my page, follow my page if you don't already. And then also, if you would go over to YouTube and follow me and subscribe there. Appreciate you guys. Without you guys, I would not be able to do what I love and um, be able to share. And who am I going to share it with you if you guys aren't here? So, again, greatly, greatly appreciate Barb, thank you so much for being here. She's going to share it with me. I'm going to share it with you. <laughs> thank you, Barb, for being here and for um, answering questions, asking questions, and kind of keeping me on track and taking time out of her day away from her husband to be here with me and you guys too. Time out of your day to come and paint with me. I hope you guys get those brushes out, get that paint out, paint something fun. Um, if you've ordered the e-packet, I'm going to send it as soon as we're done. I saw a message that popped up and said I ordered it, but I, I don't know where to download it. I email it to you because that's how my stupid website is. So anyway, you guys have a fantastic creative week. Thank you again for being here. Bye.